Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Training on the Tees. Um, my name is Daniel Taylor, and um, last time we we met, we we um, took a little bit of a poll at the end, and some folks expressed interest in um, external tables with respect to the data warehouse. And uh, I've been using those quite a bit lately with customers, and we use it quite a bit also when we're doing the ELT, the extract, load, and transformation. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about external tables with respect to the data warehouse. There we go. Um, real quick introduction. Um, some of you may already know me. My name is Daniel Taylor. I've worked at several companies uh, from a full-time um, employment perspective, Nielsen Media Research, Public Supermarkets, and New York Life Direct. Currently, I'm a principal consultant at Pragmatic Works, and I've been here for about two and a half years. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at dbabledog.com. There is my email address if you have any questions for after this webinar. And occasionally, and I need to get back at it, and I keep saying it, I need to start uh, blogging a little bit more uh, with respect to some of the things I've learned lately. So what, what group is this intended for today? Today, we're talking a little bit about of a primer for um, external tables. So it's intended for those starting out with external tables and maybe in a refresher for those who have used external tables and haven't looked at them lately. We will be covering some intermediate techniques. And uh, once again, uh, as it, many of you know me, I have very relaxed sessions. In our time together today, we're gonna talk about external tables and what does that mean to us? We're gonna talk about blob storage, the keys to access the blob storage. We're gonna talk about our external data sources, our external file formats, and we're gonna wrap it up with create and utilize our external table. These are all the pieces that we need to put together, that we need to bail wire together in order for our external table to work within our SQL data warehouse. So let's first talk about blob storage. What I love about blob storage, and we need to utilize blob storage, and in this case, we're using blob storage. You can also use Azure Data Lake for this, but that uh, is not in the scope of this presentation. So today, we're just gonna talk a little bit about blob storage. We can easily scale up and down our blob storage. We can handle all of our unstructured data within our blob storage. So any data that we receive from external sources or internally, we can store here within our blob storage. You can also use it for a tiered storage. So let's say that um, you have some archive tables, for example, or you have some tables that are, are more readily or are needed more readily and they need to be available on a regular basis. We can tier our storage from our cool storage to our hot storage. Thus, if we use cool storage, we can reduce our cost a little bit to, to our organization organization. As with Azure, what I love most about Azure is the geo redundancy, and it's easy to set up geo redundancy with respect to our blob storage. And we have multiple blob types. We have our general storage accounts, which we're gonna be talking about today, and then we have our blob storage accounts, which is what allow us to do that cold and hot tier, and we can easily append to them. And here you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, you have your account, and then within your account, your blob storage account, you'll have your containers, which here is showing pictures and movies, and then you have your blobs, your, your data that you're storing within your particular uh, blob storage account. So let's take a quick look at what, setting up uh, blob storage because it's gonna be part of our demo today. So I've already opened up my portal. I've already logged into my portal here. I'm gonna go over to my resource groups. And I've already set up a resource group it called external table demo. Inside here, I have three items already. So there's some prerequisites and uh, they're also called out in the demos. But one of the prerequisites is we already have a SQL data warehouse up and running right here. And we also have, um, I also have this storage account that we will use later um, in this, from a time-saving perspective, I wanted to get a lot of data out there that will show when we're utilizing CTAS, so ignore that. Pretend that's not there right now. We're gonna go up here, to, we're gonna hit add, and we're gonna search, and we're gonna search on a storage. You can see here, 
once we, our results return, we're going to create a Microsoft uh, is the publisher. We're going to create a storage account. We'll go over to this blade here. We'll hit create. We're going to call this external tables two. All right. And we're going to use our deployment model of resource manager. And here you can see you have general purpose and blob storage, like we mentioned on the previous slide. For the purpose of this demo, we're going to stick with general purpose. Also, you can see here it's easy to turn on uh, your replication of your data to protect it. Also, uh, we're going to use an existing um, resource group, and that's the one we utilized, we saw earlier. And we're going to utilize external table demo resource group. Um, let's go back up here real quick to um, here you can see performance premium or standard all right so and we are not going this is in preview this is really nice we can now protect our uh, storage accounts through virtual networks uh, that's on my agenda to go through there and uh, work through that but let's hit create on this so it's going to take a little bit of time for this create to create our storage account. So let's reduce this real quick. Another part of this uh, demo or part of the, the training for our external tables today is we already have a file here. So I took the factory seller sales and I exported it from the AdventureWorks DW 2016 database. And if we open it up here, you're gonna see I exported it to a piped delimited file. One of the benefits you get when using external tables within the SQL Data Warehouse is by splitting them up into multiple files. So we need to do that. So while we're waiting on our storage to create, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this external uh, table file or this file here that I created, this .txt file, and we're gonna split it up into a bunch of gzip files. And Recommendation there is you split the file up into as many files as readers you have within your SQL Data Warehouse. We're gonna see a slide towards the end that'll give you some guidance around that. But one of my friends at Microsoft um, provided me this great PowerShell script. So it's called alt split underscore params dot PS1. If we open that up real quick, Go over here to demos and you can see here that all this all of these are labeled here so you can walk through these after uh, today's session also please feel free to reach out to me after today's session um, here you can see in our alt split params uh, dot power our PowerShell script you can see here our source location and our target location here and then on top of that, how many lines we're gonna split each file into. In this case, it's really it's a really small file, so I'm gonna choose 10,000. We should get about seven outputs based off of the size of the factory seller sales within the data, uh, the at, um, AdventureWorks Data Warehouse 2016. So let's go ahead and run that real quick so we can see our output. And we'll hit the execute there. And you can see here it created a bunch of split files to our target location that we called out. Let's go to our target location so we can see that real quick. And here we're saying move these to blob storage and we'll do that here in a second in another demo. But you can see here it's split it into seven files, approximately 10,000 uh, rows per file. Um, this last one's a little bit smaller because there weren't uh, 10,000 rows to split it into. Let's go back to our Azure account real quick because we should be done and demos always work like they, sh they, uh, they should, but we should be done with our um, creation of our storage account. Great. And you can see here now that we have a storage account, external tables two, that we're gonna use for the purpose of our demos. We're gonna create a blob. 
and we're going to call this small table. So what we're doing here is we're calling, we're creating with our, our Azure storage account, we're creating a container. This container is going to be called small table. Oops, sorry, I forgot to hit the plus sign. I'm going to call it small table and for the purpose of this demo I'm only going to allow private access to myself if we wanted to allow access anonymously to the blobs just the blobs we could do that here and if we wanted to access or allow access anonymous access to our containers and then our blobs within those containers we could choose this here but for the purpose of this demo we're just using private we're going to click OK that should create really quickly so that being said, we have taken our first step to being able to utilize or create an external table using our blob storage within Azure. All right, let's go back to our slide deck. All right, so we've created, so what have we done so far? We created our blob storage, we created our container, and now We've done, and we've also done our data prep so that we can move it into our Azure storage in, an, in one of our next steps. So when we create our storage, we have the concept of keys. Azure generates two 512-bit storage access keys, providing us access to our blob storage. Those two key, there's those two keys, and you can see them there down there at the bottom. Also, Microsoft re uh, recommends if we are creating uh, keys that we create shared access signatures. This allows us to drill, uh, drill down and provide more granular access. For example, you can set a time limit that the key is good for. You can set, you can whitelist a particular set of IPs. Um, you can also give um, read, write, uh, and remove delete privileges. So the shared access signatures provide us a little bit more granular level over our keys within our Azure blob storage. Um, you can also define whether or not it, can, it needs to connect through HTTPS only. So next step then is to look at our keys within our storage and move some of our data to uh, the blob storage that we created. So within our demo here, our demos here, we are going to, and you can see here, this is gonna be one of our steps, but let's go to our portal and we'll close this blade out here. We'll close this blade out here. And you can see here we have our external tables too. I mentioned we have those two keys. Here's the two keys I mentioned. You can get key one or key two here, and you only need one of the keys to provide access to um, the Azure Blob Storage container. There's also a nice utility out there, and if you you haven't used it yet, it's called Azure Storage Explorer. We can also get our keys here. So what I wanna show real quick is, let's hit refresh here and we should see our new storage account. So you can see here, I have external tables, external tables two. Um, let's go here and we're gonna right mouse click on this and I love using Storage Explorer. It's a great way also to um, manage your data if you need to. I'm gonna copy my primary key. So this would relate back to key one in the portal like we saw, but I'm just gonna show that. So let's go over here, we're gonna need this data anyhow. So I'm gonna paste this into this notepad here. And then we're gonna go back over to our portal and I'm just gonna copy key one here. And I'm gonna go back over to my notepad. And what I wanted to show is there's no magic going on here, that there's multiple ways we can get our key. So, Another nice reason why, and I apologize there, I had to get my train of thought. Um, another nice reason to have these two keys within or that provide us access to our Azure Blob storage is, let's say that your company requires uh, rotating keys or requires you to change the keys every so often when accessing the Blob storage or any sort of storage or any sort of account within your environment. You can go through and you can say, okay, I'm using key one today, but I need to modify my code to use key two. 
I can use e key two, which hasn't been used yet, and then I can go up here, and then I can regenerate my key for key one. So then when key two is required to be changed, you can go to key one, and then you can regenerate key two. So it provides us a way to be able to rotate our keys with minimum outage to our environment. Now that we have information about our keys, let's look at how we can use them. The first thing I talked about earlier is we created these files, these gzip files that we're gonna load into our Azure SQL Data Warehouse. We're gonna take this key here, and you can see here I use, I'm utilizing a tool called AZ Copy. AZ Copy allows us to easily move our files from on-premises to our Azure storage container. I'm going to paste my key in here, and I'm going to call out a couple things here in a second. So let's paste our key there. A couple things I want to call out. Here you can see that I'm, co I'm connecting through HTTPS. I'm making a secure connection. Here is our blob storage, or I'm sorry, our storage, our Azure storage account. And then over here, you can see I'm calling the container I created small table. So I'm gonna move from my, my source, move to blob storage that's on my local C drive, and I'm gonna move this to our Azure storage account. Copy that, I've already got a admin uh, command line uh, opened up as administrator. We're gonna hit paste in here. You can see here, I took that command, and what this is gonna do is it's gonna go through and it's gonna copy our um, gzip files up to our storage account. So here you can see that we transfer, we knew we had seven files, we had seven transfers successfully in the time frame. This is gonna take time based on your, your network and your infrastructure, but you can see here that it says that we moved it. We can also go and validate that through our Azure Storage Explorer. We can go here to external tables too. Let me close this real quick here. We can see our blob containers. We can see our small table. And you can see here that our seven files have been moved to our Azure Storage account. So we created our external tables too. We created our container. We found our access keys that we that were required to load our data or move our data into our Azure Blob storage, and we moved that data using AZ Copy. So our next step then is to reduce this so we can see some stuff here. Our next step, once we have identified our access keys and learned how to use our access keys, is now to create our external data stores for Polybase. Our external data source is gonna identify our storage container location. It's gonna utilize our scope, uh, scope credential for access, and we're gonna review that here in a second. We're gonna go through a demo. Polybase is supported with SQL Server 2016 and Azure SQL Data Warehouse. Some external data sources that we can utilize are the Hadoop file system, our Azure Data Lake store, and in this case, what we're using here is our Azure storage blob container. You'll also see it referred to as uh, WASB Windows Azure Storage Blob Container, and the S just uh, indicates that it's a secure environment. Um, when we create this, we're gonna create a master key. We're gonna create a master key within our SQL Data Warehouse, and then we're gonna create a uh, scoped credential. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's create a scoped credential here. Oop, and I was supposed to do it during this session. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. So we're gonna do two demos here at once. We were supposed to create our scoped credential in our previous demo. I missed that, so we're gonna do that here. And then we're, we're gonna create our external data source. So we're, the next thing we need to do here is we need to open up our uh, a connection to our SQL Data Warehouse. And I already have that open, but I can show you here. I love doing this. Um, if you go here to our data warehouse, you can see here that they've added um, 
a nice little tile here that you can open in a Visual Studio. And if you do that, it'll launch the Visual Studio on your local machine and uh, provide the credentials. So you don't need to type in the credentials, so it's kind of nice. I've already got a uh, Visual Studio 2017 open. And you can see here that I've got my external table demo uh, database, SQL Data Warehouse, already set up. So we're going to create a new query. And where we're going to take from our demos, the first thing we need to do is we need to create a master key and we need to create a scope credential. So we're going to paste that here into our Visual Studio. We're going to change our database scope here to external table demo. Now, for the purpose of this, I'm just creating a master key within the SQL Data Warehouse. A uh, password isn't required. If you do use a password, a uh, strong password will be required. This is what's going to encrypt our credentials within our uh, SQL Data Warehouse. So we require a master key. Now, I'm going to run this, but it's going to fail. Uh, saying that a master key is already created. It's associated with other items I had to set up within the SQL Data Warehouse for the larger tables. Um, that would have taken time to move the data um, during the demo, so I got that all up there and prepped ahead of time. But we're going to run that, and it's going to say, I already have a master key within the database. Now, next thing is we're going to create a database scope credential. This credential is going to be identify our blob storage, which we know we created a blob storage account called external tables two, and then we need to put our secret key here. That's our access key that we copied out here earlier that we also utilize for our AZ copy. So we're gonna copy that real quick here, and then we're gonna paste that in here And we are going to execute this. So now we've created a scope credential. So what this is saying is that if I access this external tables to Azure Blob Storage, I have permissions to access it. This is my secret identity code, um, top secret agent, my secret identity code to be able to access that. So we've created our um, we've created our master key. We've now created our scope credential. So our next step then is to create, as we were talking about, our external data source. So let's close that down and we'll just leave that open. We'll hit cancel. So here we're going to pull up our external data source. So we're going to create our external data source here. Copy this over. All right. So and you'll notice within each of the scripts, I also um, put some notes, I also call out, so, uh, I provide some links as to uh, where you can find additional information uh, to do additional research on these particular items that we're setting up to utilize external tables within the SQL Data Warehouse. Here you can see that we're creating our external data source and I'm calling it Azure Storage Data Source Small. You can see here we're using the Hadoop connector. This is what's essentially going to tell SQL Data Warehouse I want to use Polybase behind the scenes. You can see here that we're using our Windows Azure storage uh, blob, uh, and we're using a secure connection. And we're using that credential, if you remember, Azure storage credential is the credential we created in the previous step. So this is telling the SQL Data Warehouse this is my external data source. This is where I'm going to pull my data from, and I have this credential set up that provides me access. Now, a couple things to note here. You can see here that we changed the HTTPS. This is a required change. We're calling it WASB, S, S being for the secure. Here's our location of our storage, our blob storage, external tables 2blobcorewindowsnet and then you can see here at the beginning, I call out the container. So small table at external tables dot blob dot core dot windows dot net. So this is the full path to our external data source. So let's hit run on this, or let's execute this. So now we've created our blob storage, we've created our credentials, and we've created a connection to those particular um, 
to our blob storage using those credentials. So now the SQL Data Warehouse says, okay, I know I have permissions to access this data. So our next step within our journey here is to create our external file, external file format for Polybase. So our, our external formats definition, uh, external format definition for external are stored in Hadoop, Azure Storage Blob Storage, or Azure Data Lake. Our external formats definition, we're going to utilize Azure Storage Blob Storage here. Um, this is our default. I That's funny, I need to fix that. I apologize for that. I read through this a million times and didn't catch that. And uh, so we have three external file formats that we can utilize here, either Hadoop, Azure Storage Blob Storage, or Azure Data Lake Store. Um, that should just read Azure Blob Storage, but um, or we could utilize Azure Data Lake Store. Supportive file formats, and the one we're using here is delimited text. We can also use Hive RC files. We can use Hive ORC, or we can use Parquet files. Uh, like I said, we're going to be using uh, ABS here and delimited text for the purpose of our demo. Over here is just a real basic example of what a uh, external file format would look like. You have your name here. You have your, oops, sorry about that. You have your name here. You have your field terminator. This is what's gonna identify um, what terminates each uh, column within your files that you're calling in. You have your string delimiter. We're using the default here. If you needed to, you could define your date format and we're using use type default equals false. Now, you can also use use type default equals true. What that parameter does, and these are the most common parameters I utilize when I'm creating my external file format. If you set this to false, what this is essentially going to do is store any values as null, uh, any missing values as null. Any null values that are stored by using the word null will de be delimited, uh, will be imported with the string null with quotes around it. If we were to set this to true, for example, though, um, if there was any missing data, for example, if there was a zero, uh, if there was missing data in a numeric column, it would come in as zero. If you had an, uh, if the column is a string column, it would put an empty string in there if it was coming in as null. And if um, you had a date column that was empty or null, it would come in as 1900-0101. So just something to keep in mind, you can change the behaviors of your null data coming into your external table by using this use default type, use type default. And I have some information um, in the slide notes with respect to that as well. Oops, sorry about that. So once we create our external file format, then we can create our external table. Some important notes about our external tables here. When we create an external table, we need our data types to match, and we need our number of columns to match. Um, we're referencing, and the, so our column definitions uh, must match. When referencing files and external sources, the column must match exact schema, and the type definitions must match the exact uh, schema. So here, we're using uh, the column definitions within a file base. So we're not referencing an external source, we're referencing a um, .txt file. So our data types must match and our number of columns must match. Say for example, you were calling into Hadoop, your columns must match the exact schema and our type definitions might, must match the exact schema as well. Um, I have some great references that you can look at uh, while you're while you're doing this um, internally within your own environment. Uh, location considerations here. Polybase query retrieves files from folders and all subfolders. And I can show you an example of that when we load a really large table here in a demo uh, towards the end of this session. And Polybase does not query or uh, does not return file names beginning with an underline or period. So that's something to uh, make note of when you're creating these files that you're moving to your Azure storage and then loading into your SQL data warehouse. 
Um, we have a way to handle dirty records. We can reject by a value or percentage, um, and this is known as the reject value, and we, we have our reject type, and that reject type, which is spelled wrong there, spell check this out as well. We have our reject type, which identifies our value. So if we were using value, we would have one to that two billion uh, um, million value there, or if we were using percentage, it would be 1% to 100%. So that what that is saying is if I have X number of values that I get an error on when loading our SQL data warehouse, stop the query ex when I'm querying the external table. Um, there is no way like within SSIS, no easy way to export um, those records as they uh, as they error out. Basically, it's an all or nothing. Once you hit this reject value limit, your query will stop. All right, so let's now look at creating our external file format and our external table. All right, so back over here in our demos folder, and once again, I have some scripts. Um, this one here, we're not going to utilize this one I was using for um, creating my large table. And uh, fact, reseller sales, that's just to show you that I did, this is the script I utilized to load that uh, relatively large table within our SQL data warehouse. Uh, we're going to use that to show performance uh, with respect, because we only have 60,000 rows in this smaller file for the essence of time to move through AZ copy. So we're going to look at the larger table as well. But let's look at create our external file format for our small table. So let's copy this over. Let's move this over here to our Visual Studio window. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create our external file format and you can see here that I'm using pipe delimited and when we saw our data um, earlier um, you you saw when I opened up that particular dot text file that it was pipe delimit we're using a default string delimiter I'm not calling out any specific date format and I'm using a use type of default equals false so let's create our external file format here all right that created uh, successfully so now we've identified what our file format is going to look like so next step then in our in our journey here is to create our, our external table we're creating a fact reseller sales underscore staging underscore small I'm gonna go to the bottom real quick here because I want to show show something here you can see we have our reject type We have our reject type, and we're using value. And I'm saying if I have more than five values, uh, reject this particular, reject any queries when um, pulling from our external table. You can see here that I'm using our data source that we identified in the earlier steps, and I'm utilizing the text file format small that we just identified up above. This location here slash is going. I didn't, if I had subcontainers within my uh, Azure storage, I could call that out there and I could path inside there. However, I'm just looking at the uh, root level of the, of the um, data source that I identified earlier in our, in our earlier steps. So let's create our external table. And we're going to execute that that should complete successfully so over here now we should see for our data sources I've been having issues I probably need to open a case ah there we go so you have to go up to the main root level um, you can see here for our external resources you can see our ex Azure storage data source small that we identified Here's our file format that we identified. We should also now 
see our external table small. So we've gone through all the steps. So now what we can do is we can utilize our, exter our external table. So if we wanted to, now we have our SQL data warehouse. There's no data loaded within our SQL data warehouse whatsoever. There's no data there. What we could do is we can just select and eventually what this does is it begins to return a result set. And you can see here we loaded 60,855 records and that's what I would expect. That's we just, I'm sorry, I said something incorrect there. We didn't load anything, we just queried. So we took the data that we loaded to our Azure Blob Storage, we connected that all up through those pieces. And now basically what we're doing, not basically, what we are doing is we're querying these text files, these gzip files that we have out here within our Azure Blob Storage. We haven't even imported the data yet, we're just querying it. So let's talk about some external, um, let's talk about some external uh, table usage scenarios. We can query our Hadoop or our blog store, blog, our blob storage data. I'm already on the holidays, folks. I'm already there um, and it's still got like a month to go before they really start. You can query Hadoop or Azure blob storage data with transact SQL statements. So it's what we're used to, it's T SQL, it's what we know. We can create an external table for use with elastic database queries. So. I didn't mention it earlier, but with SQL database, you can use the similar methods. Polybase doesn't come into play, but we can use elastic database queries to query external data as well from our SQL database. We can import and store data from Azure Data Lake Store into our Azure SQL Data Warehouse. We can also take the same concept there is we can import and store data from our Azure Blob Storage into our Azure SQL Data Warehouse. We can stage data for transformation, so our ELT, so extract, load our data into a staging table, and then use the power of the SQL Data Warehouse to perform to uh, perform the transformations, and we can use it for accessing archive data. If you remember back earlier, we talked about we had the different tiers. Well, with those different tiers, if we had archive data that's not being used on a regular basis, we could put that on cold storage, make sure it gets backed up, but we don't even need to load it into our SQL data warehouse. We can leave it on that cold storage, and let's say it's four or five terabytes of data. We can leave it on our cold storage, and then we can query it as we need it, not using the space within our SQL data warehouse, but providing our, say, our legal team means to access that data uh, without having to have it loaded into our data warehouse. Um, reducing cost and complexity to, to keeping that data um, with respect to um, your, your SQL data warehouse or with respect to your enterprise. So why is this really helping us? Well, looking at 60,000 rows, we're not gonna see a ton of benefit, right? I mean, it's just not gonna spin up. It would be quicker to just move that through SSIS or Azure Data Factory or something like that. However, if we're talking hundreds of million rows, hundreds of millions of rows, where we get our true benefit is that behind the scenes, Polybase is being used when we're pulling from these external tables. And we're gonna look at a demo here in a second. So Polybase is being used behind the scenes and what it does is it's gonna spin up, based on how many control nodes you have, a bunch of compute nodes behind the scenes and access our blob storage in parallel. So it's got a bunch of readers reading in at the same time and it's got a bunch of writers writing at the same time really exciting i mean it there, it's a true benefit and i get a lot of questions is well isn't it taking a lot of time to split up those hundred million rows and extract them and moving them to blob storage yes it is taking time but generally when i hit that 160 million 100 million row mark i find it's faster to go through those steps like i showed earlier breaking them up into individual files moving them to blog storage and then loading them in through an external table into my staging uh, table, which we'll look at here in a second. Um, sizing for the data load. And I, go, I talked about this earlier that we would see a slide, but basically, this is delimited text guidance. This is for a delimited text file. So evenly split our data into multiple files. 
um, when, when we look at our when we look at using external tables to load our data warehouse try and get one file per reader and we find that the limited text is fastest when we're loading into our data warehouse through external tables so you can see here on the right hand side of the screen and if you can tell this this part of the topic really excites me because this is where the true benefit of getting our data loaded into the data warehouse comes into play. This I, this gets really me excited, gets me really excited. I, for a particular client, loaded a billion rows, and now we had some DWUs and we had a lot of readers and we had a lot of files split, but we loaded a billion rows and. Uh, you know, 20, I think it was 20 minutes, 21 minutes. I, I tried to find my actual numbers and I couldn't find those. But we were able to actually load billions of rows in a really short period of time. Now, yes, it did take us time to split the files and yes, it did take time to compress them, but we had the billion rows loading through another mechanism and it was, I think, two and a half days on and we just eventually killed it. We just killed the process. It just wasn't finished. But you can see here, for example, I have a, right now my DWUs of 200 from my SQL data warehouse. So my service level objective is 200. With that level of DWU, I get 16 readers and 60 writers. One writer essentially per uh, compute node behind the scenes. So let's look at that. So create table list statements. So there's a benefit of utilizing this utilizing one of the benefits of utilizing external tables to load a staging table for example is the speed of using polybase to get that data into our data warehouse so we can then transform it so let's go over here and this is the part of the demo that you don't have uh, because it was it was over three gig the data but what all I did just for a quick note is I took this um, shoot Shoot, 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 I apologize. I took this factory seller sales within um, my local SQL Server 2016, and I just replicated it over and over again until I had, had a lot of data in there I could export and then uh, to this text file, and then uh, I moved that up. So if, if you need uh, some guidance around that, I can provide you some guidance on how I made the factory seller sales really large in order to uh, export uh, a bunch of data into our blob storage, which is what we're going to look at here. Uh, let's go back to our demos, and then we have here our create table as statement. So let's copy that real quick and get it over to Visual Studio. And then I need one more statement. We're going to look, what I wanted to show is I also wanted to show a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes here within our SQL Data Warehouse so that you could see that we're spinning up these readers and these writers behind the scenes. Uh, go back over to Visual Studio um, and do a new query. Time for a new mouse, folks. All right. So, all right. You can see here over on the left-hand side of my screen, um, I mentioned earlier that I had already created a factory seller sales uh, exter external table. I have one here called staging. I set this up earlier because it's pointing to a different um, blob storage uh, location and container with lots and lots of data in it. And then I created you know, my data source and I created my text file format for that. Let's pop over here real quick to our blob, contain, our blob storage. That's our small. So I have here external tables. I have my blob container and I have large table. Within my large table here, you can see it's relatively large, even gzipped web, much bigger than the couple of meg that we have on our small table. I have 125 meg, essentially, all the way down to the last file that got split to 58 meg. I split these into, um, I think it was uh, about 3.5 million rows per table. I also wanted to show that if you remember, we talked about external tables when we're reading from uh, blob storage, it's gonna recursively search through the file. I know there's about 22 million records here. So all I did is took this data here and copied it into this copy folder, 
But what I want to show you is that it's going to not only pull these 22 million rows in, but it's going to pull the rows from our subfolder here, our uh, sub container underneath our large table container of copy. So let's go back to Visual Studio. All right. So our first step is this is what is known as a CTAS, create table as. So we're going to create a table, fact resellers, fact reseller sales, round robin. I just chose a round robin. We're not choosing a proper, typically on a fact table, I would make it, I would provide it with a hash key. But, and I would make it a cluster column store index. But for the purpose of this, I just wanted to create a simple round robin table and load into it. How am I loading into this table? It's going to select here from our external table, factory seller sales staging. Now keep in mind, there is no data loaded within our data warehouse. This is all sitting in our text files external to our data, SQL data warehouse. So let's hit this real quick here, and we're gonna run this. So what I wanted to show here, and this takes about a minute to two minutes. What I wanted to show here is we can see what's going on. So I'm gonna select from my exec requests that are taking place right now, and I need to pull my QID, my request ID that's executing behind the scenes. I need to input that here into my DMS uh, workers, the uh, DMV here, and we're going to select from that. Now, let's reduce this so we can get some real estate. Now, what's exciting here is you can see here that we have, we can see here that we're loading in our rows and we have our external readers and we should have uh, about 16 of them because we know at a DWU um, 200 we will have 16 um 16 reader processes and then if we scroll down you can see that our 60 writer processes are bulk inserting so it's taking these 44 plus million rows and it's pulling them in from our external data source and loading them into our staging table now this could then the staging table then could be used for doing transformations either through a partition switch or through some other means to get our data into a our primary fact table um, and that takes about two minutes to finish so about another 30 seconds let me go over here real quick well, that's finishing up. Let's go back over here. So from our current slide. So we demoed our CTAS. So what did we accomplish? So we created our blob storage, which was required to store our text, delimited text files. We looked at our keys, the different ways to access our keys. We talked about our shared access keys. We, uh, we put, we, we showed where we had to put those keys. We had to put them in our external source and we had to use them for our AZ copy. We identified our external data source where our data was living within the SQL data warehouse. We, ex we defined our external file format from our SQL data warehouse so it knew what our file format needed to look like, essentially our table format, and we created and we utilized our external table. Let's see if this finished over here. Uh, and we'll run this one more time and we can see here our status and it completed great 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 so if we go over here you can see here that in two minutes and two seconds we took our data from our external table, factory seller sales underscore staging, and we loaded it into our physical table here, factory seller sales round robin. Now, if I wanted to, I could just do a select count here, and we loaded a little over 45 million rows in two minutes. Not, not bad at all, not bad at all. And, so that's it. So um, that is my little primer on external tables. Love external tables. I use them a lot when loading data into the SQL Data Warehouse or looking at archiving. Um, 
you know, I have, um, let's pop over here and let's see if we have any questions that popped up uh, because it's not indicating. Hmm. Uh, Erica, I can't see the, oh no. Where'd it go? What are you looking for, Dan? I am looking for the questions. Um, for some reason, I am not oh, finding them. Um, I can go ahead and read them out to you. That would be most excellent because All I right. am having technical issues. Awesome. Me. Well, uh, we have five minutes left. So if you have any questions, please feel free to um, type them into the chat box and we will get those answered until 12 o'clock here. Um, let me go ahead and read some out to you. Um, while the data is being loaded from Blob into Azure SQL Data Warehouse, can we view load logs? Can we view load logs? So, great question. Um, I'm a, I'm I'm thinking you're you're looking for some sort of information as to row count or something along those lines. I'm I'm thinking so it goes back to this particular query here. You don't really have a load log perspective that I'm aware of, but when we were looking over here, you can see um, each one of these steps, so you can see how many bytes your readers have read. And then it's not an exact science, but you can see here how many rows have been processed. So we could take this particular query, I'm thinking, and we could roll up by the number of rows processed and we could get some sort of logging as to how much, how many rows have been logged. I, I hope that answers that question that you were looking for there. All right, here's another question for you. Um, Azure SQL Server Database versus Azure Data Warehouse, what are the differences? Love both of them, and I think that's um, more than a 30-second um, conversation. If you'd like to send me an email around that, I do have some slide decks with information around that. Basically, in a nutshell, real quick, to try and do this in 30 seconds or less, I look at SQL database when I'm looking at databases that are one terabyte or less and relational in nature. Once they start getting above one terabyte, you can put them in SQL database. However, it starts becoming quite costly. So at that point, if I have a database or I'm moving an on-premises database that's larger than one terabyte, and it's in a fact and dimension type schema, I start looking at my SQL data warehouse. Other things I look into is the number of concurrent queries. If it's an OLTP type database, SQL data warehouse can work for you, but you need to use a hub and spoke mechanism and surround items around it like analysis services and SQL databases. If it's purely OLTP, I still really like SQL databases for that. But feel free to send me an email on that as well, because there's it's a bigger discussion than I can have in 30 seconds with you on, on this particular webinar. All right. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm going to take one more question because we only have two minutes left here. Um, what would be the better approach if I want to load data from one SQL data warehouse to the other SQL data warehouse table? Mm. So as far as I know, we don't have a direct connection. No, we don't have a direct connection between two SQL data warehouses. So if it's an incremental load, if it's something that's going from one data warehouse to another and it's small data changes, but we get into our issues there with the cluster column store indexes, you may want to look at ADF version 2. Um, that's a fine question, one I haven't um, really dealt with a lot. That's a great question, but thinking through knowing the SQL data warehousing technologies, I would probably still dump that to an Azure blob storage and then load it into my Azure 
data warehouse, but it's going to be dependent upon the number of rows. If it's a small number of rows, dimensions, I may use something like SSIS or ADF v2. If it's a large number of rows, I would take the external table approach that we kind of looked at here. Um, whoever asked that question, please send me an email. I want to have a further discussion around that because that actually may be a great blog post and a great discussion I'd love to have to you with you um, with respect to more details on what you're doing. Okay, thank you, Dan. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up since it is 12 o'clock. Um, so thank you, Dan, for your presentation today. Um, I know a couple of you um, have been asking for Dan's um, uh, email address. It is dtaylor at pragmaticworks.com if you want to reach out to him. Um, thank you all for joining our free webinar today. I have a couple people asking about um, a recording of this webinar. Yes, we do record all of our sessions and you'll be receiving um, an email tomorrow, a follow-up email tomorrow that includes a link to that recording. You can also find the recording um, on our website at pragmaticworks.com. So thanks again for your time, and we look forward to seeing you all next Tuesday for another free training session. Thanks, Eric, uh, all, uh, all, the, uh, all the decks and demos will be provided to those who attended as well today, correct, as well? Uh, yes, you Once can just send those to me. Okay, great, great. Will do. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a great holidays, everyone, and a safe one.